There's quite a few people that feel like everybody's out to hurt them. Oh, they hurt me again. Oh, they hurt me again. <clears throat> to the point to where they're almost paranoid, thinking when they enter into a, a, a room or a place or a gathering of people, that for sure somebody's out to get them. I, I believe they call that paranoia. The Bible even says in Proverbs, the wicked fleeth when no man pursueth. You know what that means? He's on the run, looking over his shoulder all the time, even when nobody's after him, because he feels guilty about some things. All right, so we've got to deal with our own personal guilt. We've got to take all of our sin to the Lord. Everybody say sin. sin. See, people don't want to say that word in church very much anymore. You don't hear the politicians say, they say, well, I made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, let's just say it what God calls it. He calls it sin. Amen? And, and, and repent and say, Lord, I need your help and change and go on. All right, so we, we talked about how we should repel offenses because we have lots of opportunities to get hurt. I mean, let's face it. Every day we have opportunity for people to hurt our feelings. And what happens is if we allow these hurts to go deeper within our hearts, we'll end up having such unforgiveness and bitterness that it ends up hurting us because... You know, to be offended by someone does not hurt them, it hurts you. And see, we're all about keeping your spirit free. Jesus came to give us freedom and liberty instead of that uh, constant, uh, uh, what do you say, oppression upon us that happens even in our emotions. I believe to have an offense is like having a spiritual hangnail. You know, it's just getting festered up and getting worse and worse if you don't deal with it. Have you ever got a splinter in your finger and just kind of couldn't get it out and thought, well, it'll work its way out, and then it got all worse and festered up and may could even get infected? Well, that's exactly what the devil wants to happen with a little offense. All right, so, um, you know, it, it, it becomes an irritation in our spirit when we're offended. It grows into something more painful, and you can be offended at people. And you can be really offended at God if you don't watch it. The devil likes to blame a lot of stuff on God. Well, God made so-and-so die. God, you know, did this. God's responsible for it. And I've had pastors to get up in, in the pulpit on funerals where somebody was in a car accident at 16 years old and say, well, God just wanted another angel in heaven. That made everybody in the church that didn't understand God mad at God. And here's the latest. Well, I know God didn't do it, but God allowed it, so I'm mad at him for allowing it. <laughs> and there's certain natural laws called gravity. You can fall down and skin your knee and blame it on God for inventing gra gra gravity. Say, so, well, God, you know, made the gravity, so I'm mad at him. Right. No, the devil specializes that you blame in God for everything. So if things didn't go quite right, if things didn't go as you had planned, maybe you used your faith and things didn't turn out the way you thought it should, Remember this, we don't really, we can't really afford to ever blame God for stuff. There are things about God we don't understand. It doesn't mean we will never understand them. It just means that we can't understand everything now. I believe we can understand more things the more we get our experience with God, the more we understand his word. But we have to, until then, in some cases, follow not understanding called faith. And that's what it takes to please him. Amen? Here's some ways in which we tend to get offended. We get offended when stores don't do us right. We get offended because the government are, are doing some, are some things that we don't appreciate, don't like. You know, you can get uh, offended at the traffic. You can get offended at high prices. I can't believe the cost of gas. And just get mad, you know, have a chip on your shoulder about it and take it to work with you and tell everybody about it. Say, so, well, you know, uh, I'm not offended about gas, but why are you always talking about it? You're so mad because the price is so high. You see? See, we, we need to acknowledge when we are offended instead of act like everything's okay and you're super spiritual and covering it up. Now, let's get real with ourselves. Amen? We can get disappointed at ourselves and be offended at ourselves. We can be uh, offended at the truth. You know, so when you go to church, something's preached on that your fleshly nature don't like, then you get offended at the word and sometimes I get the hit too. You know what I mean? It's like the messenger always gets in trouble for a message that comes from God that a person doesn't like. It's amazing. So that's when they have negative things to say about me. That's when they start picking me apart. He talks about money too much. He's still wearing glasses and he's not healed. <laughs> I wonder why he drives a car nicer than mine. But you pay more payments than I do. 
See, stuff like that. And I just don't, don't get it. You look for a way to tear somebody apart whenever you're offended by them. And you know what? The truth is this. If we want to, we could pick everybody apart. Shoot, I know so much about most of you people in here, in this church, where I could pick you all apart. Oh, I know some things that really mess up some folks if they knew. I'm supposed to be confident, though, with everything. But yet, you should be appreciative that I'm your pastor, I'm trying to help you, and give me a little slack even when I'm sometimes misunderstood. Right. Amen. Yeah. Right. We don't need to be offended by God's Word. We need to love His Word. So whatever He says is for our own good. Amen. And the real tr proof, a real test of our compliance and allegiance and our submission to God is how do we handle a truth when it's preached even when we're guilty? So you can say you're submitted to God all you want to, but when you're not obeying Him whenever you've heard the truth, that's the proof that you're resisting Him. And to resist God means that you're still not going to operate under the full blessings of the Lord. He loves you and that's not going to ever change. But the blessing is going to be with hell because you're resisting his principles. We can get, we can get mad, you know, at, at a message simply because we're resisting it. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, talks about the last days. And this whole chapter of 24 is talking about the last days, what's going to happen in the last days, just prior to Jesus' return. And in that, in this verse, it talks about how in the last days, uh, many shall be offended. Many shall be offended. And when you look at that word offended, in the Greek, of course, it means to cause to stumble. But also, this word means to entrap, entrap. In other words, it's giving a pictorial story of one who has set a trap to catch an animal. But the part that is, the word that is offend, is the part of the trap or the setup that's the actual bait that lures the person in for the trap. Which means the devil wants to set you up with an offense so he can trap you. Get you bothered by somebody. Ticked off by somebody. The devil uses offenses as bait to entrap you. And here's how it works. Here's how it works. You, you got your heart right with God. You're going to church. You're in the Word. You're growing in the Lord. Things get better. You get a little happier. But then all of a sudden, somebody does something to bother you. The pastor says something that bugs you, irritates you. Somebody looks at you a certain way, and you're troubled. There's something you'd like to do in a church, but they didn't pick you. They picked somebody else to do it instead of you. And you got the gift to do it. You're not noticed and you think you should be noticed. Something went wrong. And what happens is you get aggravated because something didn't go right. You get off track. You're mad. You break fellowship with that person or you distance yourself because you're bothered by them and you don't want to go back. You are offended. You are offended. What's the word offend really mean? We can break it down to, and this is a review a little bit, of what we did last time and before we get into some new material. It means off-ended. It means off-ended, which means you're on your track, growing in the Lord, fulfilling your destiny, on your way to become everything God wants you to be, every day following the Spirit, growing and maturing, on the right path, but what offense does is knock you off that path, and that process is ended, which means you're in a holding pattern as long as you are offended. And the devil wants all of us to be in a holding pattern. He wants to keep the ceilings on your life. He wants to keep you going around the mountain of Mount Sinai. He don't care if it's 40 more years. Did you hear me? He don't really care. He really hopes it will be. Because he'd like to keep you from growing and becoming and seeing progress take place in your life. He wants you to just have a dream without it ever being fulfilled. He wants you to talk about all the blessing that's going to come but someday never arrives. And the reason why is not God's fault. Many times it's because of our own stubbornness and our own selfishness that keeps us in this track.
tell me this, tell me this please. Why is it that we know that people have always been offended since the beginning of time? Why would it be that it's mentioned in chapter 24 of Matthew when it comes to the last days? It is a trait of the last days, which means out of all times in history, during the time prior to the return of Jesus, people are going to be more offended than ever before with others because the selfishness level has never been higher than where it's at right now. And selfishness says, I don't like it because it didn't go my way. I'm upset because you didn't make me feel good. And if you don't make me feel good, I don't like you. You make me mad. And what people do is they try to change people so they'll be different so they can make them feel good. And they're miserable at their attempts to try to control and manipulate the situation. And when they can't, they back off because they feel like they can't control it. It's called Jezebel at work. And don't feel like you can take it easy, men, because I've seen it operate in men too. Amen. So we've got to understand what's going on. And this whole word is to get us to understand up front so you won't be shocked. So you can identify it in yourself and be honest and real with you that when it comes up that you're not going to participate. I'm sorry. I refuse to participate in offense. In Matthew chapter 24, another verse or so down, verse 12, it says that the love of many shall wax or grow cold. And this is referring to Christians. That those that were on fire for God at once are neutralized by their offenses. That those who want to operate in their spiritual gifts and be committed in their church and do the work of the ministry, the devil wants to get them off-ended and, because and it brings their hearts to a place of coldness to where they don't care if somebody hurts. They don't care if they slap somebody back or jab somebody back or say something in retaliation to hurt them because they feel hurt. It's time for us to grow up and get over our baby stuff and go on. If we want to talk about getting off the milk, the Bible says that the, the proof that your own milk is that there's the dissensions and strife and envies among you. And because that's among you, that's the proof that you're not ready for the meat because you're still acting like a baby. No matter how big you talk, how many spiritual words you can use, how much you can brag about what you can do for God, it's that if you can't live the standard of a mature person, it doesn't matter. You're still going to choke on the steak when it's delivered. You might sit there and say amen and bob your head up and down, and it's good to say that by the way I like it, but it's not a proof that someone has received anything you have said. Come on now. I, I've seen people say amen at the wrong time, so they knew, I know they weren't with me. <laughs> Some people ain't really here, they're somewhere else. And God wants you all here, amen? All of you here, amen? All right, so the offense, uh, uh, you know, comes, and an offense starts to be a little thing, and then another little thing, and then another little thing, and then another little thing, and then if it's not dealt with, and you're not forgiving complete enough, then our love grows cold toward each other. And we don't feel for whether somebody's hurt or not or where they're coming from or what they must be dealing with. Or we don't care because we don't even want to walk a mile in their shoes because we, they should be understanding me. Me, me, me. No, me. No, I'm hurting. Look at me. I want this. I like this. I don't know why you don't do this in church instead of that. And if you did, I'd be happier. And then I would be feeling better about being here. You know what? There are a few things that go on in this church. That is not my preference. I do it for the benefit of you because I love you. You see what I mean? I don't pick and choose decisions based upon my preferences. I can't afford to do that. My preferences, by the way, is wear jeans and a t-shirt. But if we're going to fulfill the vision today, I need to dress for what we want to build which means you can't afford to dress for comfort because it ain't about you. Amen. It's about the kingdom. Amen. So who are we trying to reach out to? Not just the down and outers, but those who are also success in business. Why? Because Jesus loved everybody. Amen. So I'm going to dress for the middle of the road for what's acceptable in this culture. Amen? Amen. So, that, so the occasion determines and the vision determines what you're going to be prepared for. Amen? 
We can get offended by a lot of stuff. You know the best time to deal with a problem? When is it? When it's a little problem. When it's a little fish before it's a big fish. That's good, Chip. Take care of it. The best time to forgive someone is the moment you begin to feel, did you hear that word again? Feel offended. Now, don't think the feelings don't play a big part. People come to this church, and they visit, they become a newcomer, and I ask them, why would you come back? Well, I just feel good about this church. They won't many times say, well, I enjoyed the word, and that's okay, and, and for sure I'd like people to come back for more reasons than whether I preach here or preach good or not, you know, but, you know, I try my best, and, you know, but, but they'll always say they came back because of the feeling they had. They may not be able to put their finger on it exactly what they felt, but they just knew, I'd like to return to a place of a good emotion. And I know we can't afford to live our lives by emotion, but let's face it, we do want to be at a place of a good memory. We do want to be at a place where we feel like it's safe. We want to come to a place where we feel accepted. Everybody wants to be at a place where they feel loved, feel embraced. Come on, we want you to be a part of something bigger than us, bigger than you, bigger than me. So feeling plays a big part in our life. And we've got to watch out not to let feelings get to the place that they govern areas that we should not allow it to govern. You know, I love my wife, but I don't always have this woo feeling about her every minute. Actually, and you want me to be honest, there's some things that she does that ticks me off. And some things I do that do the same thing to her. But I can choose to be offended at her and just be bothered by her and not talk for two or three days like some people I've counseled. Amen? Or you can just let it go and say, no, I've committed to her. And that's why we have to have a commitment of covenant. Come on now. Because every time you feel like you want an option to jump ship, you have to come back to the covenant. Why do we make covenant? Well, I'm afraid to make covenant because if I do, you know, uh, uh, some, I may want to get out because it might get a little bit tough on me and I wish I hadn't made that covenant. Well, that's why a lot of people get divorced. Amen? Amen. You know? But here's the deal. Covenant is really this for this reason. You don't really know what your future holds with that person. You don't know what you'll find out, what her crazy thing is that she'll do or say or or he'll do or say. But you're committed to love them and stay with them no matter what. Oh, I've been offended. Oh, she's been offended. At least once a day. <laughs> if you live with somebody real close, stuff is going to bother you. Little stuff. Like, did you put the toilet roll on? or Oh, you put it on backwards. What's backwards? What's the right way? Oh, this is the right way. No, this is the right way. You made the bed up. You did it this way. It's your turn to take out the trash. Look, the dishes are piling. A little thing, you know. And if you let stuff build up, you're going to be mad. They did something little that you blew up about. You know, like this, like this woman who just let stuff build up, build up, build up about her husband. Stuff he didn't throw away his dirty underwear into the dirty clothes basket, right? He just left it on the floor in the, in the bathroom and, you know, didn't put the towel away and, you know, hang a wash rag over on her sink and, you know, <laughs> it makes a mess of things. And then she gets bothered by this little thing and then the next little thing, then another little thing. And then she's in the kitchen while he's watching the ball game and she's not laying the plates on the table real easy. She's going, bam! <laughs> then she's not closing the the cabinet's real easy to the, she goes, bam, you know, in the kitchen, slams them. And he's going like, hmm, you try not to think about what's going on because you're in the game. But are you in the game? <laughs> she comes in and says, well, I guess you're not going to become the table today to eat your supper. And then she sees you put your feet on the coffee table where you always put your feet on the coffee table. She said, get your feet off the coffee table. And then she just punches him right out the window. And he's saying, 
what happened? And she won't tell him. Why? Because she is offended. And she allowed it to develop and get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, the highest level of spiritual maturity, according to Jesus, is to consistently, unconditionally love people. You know what? People look at all types of spiritual ladders of elevation to get their titles and positions and leadership. But you know what? The real thermometer of all of that, according to the Bible, if we want the Bible, is who can love unconditionally and forgive people and get over yourself and stop living for you and live for somebody else. The proof that you're living for Jesus is that you're living for other people. You got to give up your life in order to find it. You can't be happy with your life until you give it away. And offense is, a to is totally unproductive. It's totally unproductive. Nothing good comes from it. Offenses is totally unproductive. In uh, Psalm chapter 133, verse 1, it says that God loves unity. The anointing upon our lives and the anointing upon the church is multiplied when we love each other, get along well, and have complete unity. And the devil will do everything to keep us apart. Everything. That's why some of y'all got a little bit nervous that, you, that I may be putting the pressure on somebody to come up here and join them in, in uh, covenant today. But I don't, put the covenant, I don't put the pressure on nobody. This is between you and the Lord. I don't decide, decide that you're supposed to join yourself to me. No, you decide where you're supposed to join yourself to this church. You see? So I don't put the pressure on nobody. But why do you feel the pressure? Because you're bothered about making a commitment. You're bothered about making a commitment. Do you need to go ahead and find out where you belong and get in there with both hands and both feet? Instead of dancing around courting everybody for a while and never really making a commitment. Put the ring on the finger and let's go. Amen? Let's take care of business. Let's go on with God. Amen? Let's just put that part behind you and forever settle it. That way you won't be looking at other women. Amen? Amen. Amen preach. All right. Here's the new material. Are you ready for this? People are so offended by other folks. What they'll a lot of times say is, yes, I'm offended. I'm offended, and, 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 and you are the one that offended me. But you know what really is happening? They're passing the blame onto somebody because nobody makes you do anything. Nobody makes you feel anything. You choose what you feel. And sometimes it's a split second. And sometimes we don't know how come we got these emotions going inside of us. But you can be tempted to be offended and not take the offense. See, when I get when I get tempted to be offended, it's my choice whether I'm going to hang on to offense. And what determines whether I'm going to hang on to it or not is what level of selfishness do I occupy today at this moment. And if you're having trouble letting go of the offense, you need to admit to yourself, I am one selfish person right now, and God is not pleased with the way I'm doing this. I'm carrying something in my heart that is not pleasing to God, and I know it. And you know if I can feel it, he can feel it. Because, oh, he's in contact with everything with you, and he knows more about you and got a better pulse on you than what you got on yourself. And you've got to realize that God is not pleased by that. Now, if it don't bother you that God's pleased or not, then, you know, go and find another God to serve. I don't know. But if you're in love with Jesus, then you've got to let him be your friend and be real with him. And don't allow your heart to grow cold like you said, it's going to happen to a lot of people and say, well, everybody does it. Everybody doesn't do it. I don't do it. I know many of you, you don't allow your lives to go with offenses in your heart. You just refuse it. You know how damaging it is to you, plus how it brings grief to the Holy Ghost. So, you know, we tend to pass the buck, pass the blame. Say, you know, well, you know, if you just stop acting this way, then I won't be offended. But, but we've got to look at ourselves and stop thinking it's their fault. You know, they probably remind you of somebody in your past that bothered you. Something they said triggered a subconscious, a subconscious memory. 
So it's recorded how you're supposed to respond emotionally. So your heart beats like the same day it did the day when you were offended years ago. Your, your, your pulse rate goes up to that level. It's recorded how your blood pressure is supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to feel when somebody looks at you that way. This is how you're supposed to feel when somebody says that. By the way, she reminds me of Aunt Susie. And she made me mad when I was eight years old. She slapped me, told me that I was a bad boy. And if you don't trace this thing back to where it came from, the devil's got your tomorrow already planned. Because he's going to hang you up and schedule a lot of Aunt Susie's in your life to literally mess you over. He will. If the church doesn't talk about where these things are coming from and begin to deal with it, we're going to be a bunch of church attendants that's just dysfunctional. Coming to church where pastors are holding their breath and hoping that nobody's going to beat each other up in the parking lot or say something to hurt somebody's feelings. It ought to be a place of safety. It ought to be a place where people can come and just be themselves and love just the way they are and don't have to become somebody else someday before they were finally accepted. That's a good time to shout and praise God. Amen. Amen. And this is one of those churches. And the troublemakers just have to go somewhere else. Amen. Because we're going to have happy family here. We're going to have a functional family here. We're going to have a loving family here. And I can't speak for other families, but I can tell you this. Mama and Daddy didn't allow no unloving going on in that home. I didn't come from some of the craziness that some of y'all did. And I don't know and I, how it is, why it works. And this, this way, I'm just going to be honest. All right. But maybe it has something to do with my call. And those of you that went through difficulties as a child, I feel for you. But I don't feel sorry for you. And I'm not going to let you wallow in your pity because you're not a little boy and not a little girl anymore. It's time for you to grow up and realize you're stronger than that now. And they cannot do that to you anymore. And you're now a child of God, forgiven, washed in the blood. you got a new identity. And they can't shove you into a wallet-sized picture when God's called you to be a portrait. And when they see you and they can't receive a, a watermelon concept and try to have a little bean up here when they look at you. You know, you can't, you can't shove a watermelon concept into a pea brain. And then it's not up to you to prove to them who you are. But you can't be messed with their evaluations of you. And please listen to me. You know, you don't need to ever evaluate yourself based upon how someone sees you, have seen you, and how they have treated you. No, 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 no. Who you really are should be connected with a, an agreement of what heaven has to say about you, who, what God has to say about you, who God says you are, and get a hold of that real good. Because you're going to need to get a hold of it real good. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and was fasted, everything that he did that he was tempted with the devil was all about whether he knew who he was or not. If you are the Son of God, turn this stone to the river. If you're the Son of God, jump off here. If you're the Son of God, he, he faced it off with the Scripture every time. But when he came out of there, the Bible says he came with the power of the Holy Ghost when it was all done, defeated the enemy, right? He began his ministry. You can't begin your ministry until you settle the question of who you are. And if you've got to fast 40 days, I suggest it. But most of us aren't ready to sacrifice that much to get our heads straight. I have. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. Amen. You know, that's why the Pharisee was so mad at Jesus. But there's a scripture that says, but he knew who he was, and he knew where he was going. Amen. Somebody walked up to me and said, oh, you're not a real pastor. I'd laugh in their face. <laughs> really? I couldn't get away from this. I was born a shepherd. How do you know that? He told me. How'd you find out? Spent quite a few days in fasting, seeking God, find out what he got to say about it. If one comment and one look is all it's going to take to put you into a land of wondering, you don't have yourself cemented and grounded enough in God's word and God's relationship to know who you are is very important. And you don't need to apologize to anybody. And it don't matter how they see you. Too bad they can't see you like you really are. But you need to try to see people as they really are and love them and realize they have a limited view. 
a limited view. You can't wait to change people to get over your offenses. You can't get them to make you feel better in order for you to stop being offended. You're going to have to deal with your temptation to be offended because temptation to be offended is like any other temptation for anything else. You can be tempted to do all types of sin, all types of wrong. You can be tempted to look at uh, pornographic stuff. You can be tempted in so many areas, steal, but you don't have to take the opportunity and say you're going to go with it. Have people hurt me? Yeah, but I want it to be short-lived. Amen. I'm not going to carry it around for several days, months, and several years like some people do. This is not God's way for your freedom. And we can't afford to feel that way toward each other. I don't, I've heard people say, just suck it up. If you do suck it up, you've got to still throw it up. You know what I mean? I mean, you've got to get rid of it somewhere because it will make you sick. You know? I mean, you've got to get rid of it. You've got to go to God and say, Lord, so-and-so bothered me. What they did hurt my feelings. And you've got to say, I forgive them. Don't wait till you feel like forgiving them. Say, I forgive them. If you say what you need to do, feelings will follow. The right feelings. That's why you can't afford to live by that. You've got to let it go at that moment. You've got to start talking to yourself. Hey, I, I know they, they hurt me right here, but you know, I'm just going to let it be like water off a duck's back and let it go. Amen. Look at Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Watch this. Matthew eleven twenty-five. 25. Can you take a little bit more? I'm sorry, Mark eleven twenty-five. 25. Yeah, Mark. Can y'all take a little bit more? We're not going to go too much longer because I know some of y'all are sniffing that food. I don't want nobody to drool on your Bible. Yeah, that's right. We got the food right here too, huh? Mark eleven twenty five. 25. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, watch this. Forgive him. Let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. In order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. Everybody say, let it drop. drop. Leave it. it. Let it go. Let it it drop. drop. Leave it. it. Let it go. go. One more time. Let it drop. drop. Leave it. it. Let it go. go. You cannot afford to keep holding on to stuff like this. Come on and be free, everybody. I want the church to be a free church. I don't feel like you can lift your hand instead of going, oh, so hurt because they hurt me at work. Oh, so hurt because my wife says I messed up in the car. Oh, so hurt because this happened. No, just let it go. Just let it go. Your pride wants to fight for this. What good will it do? Just make you miserable and keep you from being free. Let's be free in Jesus, Amen. And this is how it's done. He goes on to say that if you want your father to forgive you, you're going to have to forgive others. Which means the proof that he is going to forgive us has everything to do with whether or not we can forgive other people. For how can we expect a God to forgive us that we still do not forgive others? Are you hearing this? That is a hard saying. That is a hard saying. You know what that tells me? Forgiveness is not an option if you're going to heaven. Oh, that's as straight as it comes right there. You hardly ever have anybody say it, but those are the words of Jesus. It's in the red. So you can't afford to keep on holding unforgiveness toward nobody because it could determine whether you go to heaven or not. Now, it's right there in the book. I just read it. I just read it. I just read it. How many of y'all agree, if God doesn't forgive you, you're not going to heaven? Amen. Has he made a provision for us all to be forgiven? Yes. Is it all over with? Yes. But we're messing it all up by showing him that we don't have the revelation of his forgiveness by us not giving forgiveness to people who offend us. We've just got to let it go. Amen. Let it go. We get offended when people say stuff to us like, oh, you're just a janitor. 
Oh, you don't have a job now, like you're nothing. Oh, you're just a stay-at-home mom. I can understand why that would ruffle some women's feathers. No, I'm building giants for God. Amen? Amen. If you're going to stay on being a mama, then you make your children the first, the first priority to make sure they grow up to serve God, know God, fill, it, fill their whole life every day with God, God, God. When they rise up in the morning, as they eat in the day, when they walk along the way, and when they last down, you can't go wrong. You can't get them to OD on God. You cannot overdo it. Amen. Don't be offended by it. Know who you are. If God's called you to be a stay-at-home mom, don't let nobody intimidate you or offend you because they think that's not, not good enough. Because I'm better than you. I'm a career woman. Well, la di da. What good would it be if you win the whole, you know, gain the whole world and lose your soul? Your children do. What is that? Your first disciples ought to be your own children. I said your first disciples ought to be your own children. And if you can't disciple your children, how can you know for sure you can disciple adults? That's why those that are starting off in ministry, we need to get them in children's ministry a little bit more. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't want to be back there. They're just kids. Thank God they don't get offended like you. <laughs> they're not just kids. They're little people. And they don't have much experience yet. And they're loaded out like sponges ready to receive whatever you show them. It takes it in like a recording. They'll soak up Jesus if you show them Jesus. Amen. Come on. I got to admit, this one has bothered me. Oh, you, go, you just go to a small little church? I just had to let it go. I know a lot of big churches, a whole crowd's going to hell. Not all of them. I'm not saying all big churches, all of them going to hell. I'm just saying I know some, the whole crowd's just going to hell. Big does not necessarily mean right. But we think that because that's part of American culture. If you're big, you're successful. No. Don't, people, don't let people intimidate you because you go to a church that doesn't run the thousands. We may run the thousands someday, but if we do, we're going to do it right. Amen. 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 We're not going to lose that close feeling. Amen. And uh, I admire quite a few that, by the way, do have big churches that are doing well, that they are doing right. But don't let people offend you because of that. You know, Jesus proved that he didn't let stuff get to him. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I really do believe some people, the devil uses them to try to tempt us to hold an offense, and they didn't even mean to cause us to be tempted to be offended. Don't ever say, they offended me. That is a misnomer, according to the Scripture. They did something that you chose to be offended by because you have choices. Well, I didn't have choice that I had this feeling. It just came from, I don't know where it came from, but, you know, they said this and I got it. I didn't even choose it. No, but you choose what you're going to do with it. You choose what you're going to do with that. But you've got to be real and honest with yourself to realize this is disrupting the flow of the freedom of the Spirit inside of you, and you must address it because you just decided you're going to live a free life. I have decided I am going to live a free life. I am not going to let anybody uh, bring a fence into my life. I'm not going to hold a grudge with nobody. I don't have a single person I can think of that I have not forgiven totally and completely. If I saw them at Walmart or Publix, I would not take the other aisle to avoid them. And believe me, I have had more than my share of crazy stuff that have happened to me of people who just plain out mad at me because they're mad at the word that I preach, even though I'm a nice guy. I don't know. It's amazing how creative the devil can be to come up with some stuff to say about ministers. But you know what the Bible has to say about it? Do not believe an accusation against an elder, which means a leader or a person that's leading in the ministry. Because the reason why is because the devil will do everything he can to turn people against leaders. Because if they leave the leaders, the flocks will scatter. And that person is responsible for all of them going to hell. So we don't need to, to touch God's anointed, amen, or the ministries that God's using. And I'm very careful. If you notice, I don't name any names of any pastors. Any ministers that I don't agree with, I don't watch every, every minister, I don't listen to every minister. I've got my favorites just like you do. 
Huh? But isn't that freedom? Right? There's some that minister to us better than others, others do. But I'm not going to say negative things about the ones who don't particularly minister to me or those that I think, hey, you're on the wrong path. If I'm talking to you personally and I'm hearing you listen to somebody that's really taking you the wrong way, I'll tell you, hey, you need to be watching out for that because that doesn't line up with the word. I'll tell you that. You know, Jacob, I'm just going to tell you this in closing. Jacob, he had many opportunities to be offended by Laban because his father-in-law did so many terrible things to him. I'm telling you what, there's nowhere in the account of Genesis that says that Jacob was offended or had a bad attitude or had unforgiveness or bitterness toward the man. But most of us wouldn't have been able to take it. Seven years got to work for, for the one he loved, Rachel. And when he finally goes to the wedding, she's behind a veil, he ends up finding out the next morning after the first night that she's not even the one he's supposed to get. He gets the older daughter who is Leah and not the one that he loved. That is terrible for anybody to do anybody like that. So you know what he had to do? He said, look, I want Rachel. He said, well, you can have Rachel, but you've got to work several more years, but you can have her now, but you've got to keep on working for me. Seven more. So when he goes seven more years, the man does everything imaginable to try to trick him, deceive him, or to do things to business-wise that's unfair business practices to try to offend Jacob, and Jacob does not get offended. And what happens is Jacob is the one watching over the livestock of Laban. Laban gives him, uh, Jacob so many livestock. and say, here, as they multiply, they're yours. As mine multiply, they're mine. Laban starts off with so many more than Jacob had. But God calls Jacob's livestock to multiply faster than Laban's. Well, I'm telling you what, when you don't hold an offense, God's got a way of blessing you. Please hear me. Now, everybody here knows that only God can cause this group of livestock to multiply faster than this group. That if Jacob did anything to contribute, it was the mind of God that he tapped into to make it happen. It's important that we refuse offenses because to refuse offenses attract the blessings of God. Attract the blessings of God. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, it says love covers a multitude of sin. A multitude. It covers it. It covers it. It covers it. Covers in the Greek means to conceal, to clothe, to hide, to keep a secret. Y'all all remember the story about how Noah and his family got off the ark after the big flood, and they planted vineyards, and anyway, Noah found out that it tastes good to drink that grape juice and took a little bit too much of it. The Bible said he got drunk in his tent, and when you get drunk, you do some stupid stuff. I don't know why, but the man was naked, laying over there in his tent, drinking his wine. But one of the sons went in there, his name was Ham, and he saw the nakedness of his father and thought it was funny. And when he told his brother, he said, hey, you ought to see what dad's doing in there. He's, he's a real idiot. Look at him. He's in there drinking. He's all naked in his tent. Come in here and look. But the other two guys did not go in and look. They grabbed the sheet, one in one corner and one on the other corner, Shem and Japheth, and backed up with their face turned away from him and covered him up in his nakedness. But you know what? The Bible tells us that that one who looked upon his nakedness and did not respect his father, was cursed. But the two that covered him when he needed to be covered, they lived a life of blessing. And, and Shem, by the way, is the lineage of Jesus. Do you see what I mean? I'm just telling you, God has a way of blessing us whenever we cover other people's weaknesses and sin. We're so quick to tell other people their sin. We want to tell, tell folks, Hey, man, let me tell you something. We like to tell stuff on people. That's the fleshly nature. We've got to stop that and realize that's not a part of the Spirit of God in us. That's not the, the Jesus in us at all. That's the demons that want to do wrong things. That's the fleshly nature that wants us to tear down people's lives. Why do we want to do that? It makes us look better. 
People who are constantly telling negative things about other people, it's because they got a self-image issue and they don't know who they are because they haven't spent their time in the wilderness getting it straight with God. That's so silent. I couldn't, couldn't hear a chip break on the dip. It's coming. Let me just make this one point. I'm going to land this plane and here we go. It's very important that you cover other people instead of being so quick to uncover them. And what's it going to take to cover them? Love. That sheet was love. That sheet was respect. That sheet was the fear of God. The honor of that's my father. That's my father. That's my father. Yeah, he's having a, a bad episode right now, but he's going to get over it. He's going to probably repent when he gets out of here and never do it again. But that's my father. Amen. That's love. You should say in this church, but that's my sister. But that's my brother. That's my pastors. And I just will cover them. I will cover them. Why? Because I know their heart. I know their heart. Some people would rather trap some people in their words and magnify what they do on the surface rather than to see the heart and remember that's the real person right there.